So, everybody take a seat. We're getting started right now. I want to first off mahalo you. We've got a, a great panel right now. It's called From Standing Rock to Mount Counter. Introduce my great friend who's going to be moderating, Andre Perez. Aloha, aloha, aina kako. Aloha, aloha. Um, I'm gonna stand close to the antenna so I don't keep cutting out. Um, we all know Mauna Kea was our big struggle. We all know that Standing Rock was a big struggle for our Lakota friends at Standing Rock, um, Standing Rock Reservation, North Dakota. And some of us were fortunate um, to be able to reciprocate support and to go out to Standing Rock. Um, Myself and others like Columbia Hill, Uncle Earl, De Leon, um, and many others went to Standing Rock from Hawaii. But um, I want to just talk a little bit about the importance of that uh, that reciprocity in terms of um, support and that unity and that cohesion and solidarity. The only way we're going to you know hold our ground against these kinds of struggles is by working together and supporting one another. Yeah. So we went out to Standing Rock, I went out twice, and um, I made a lot of good friends there. I met a lot of good people. I met a lot of talented, Akamai intelligent people. And when I saw some of the things that they were doing, I wanted to bring that back to Hawaii. And so this past week, uh, we've been spending time with about a dozen people, artists and poets and hip hop artists, um, at our farm in a um, action art camp retreat where we were learning um, low budget, low tech, kind of guerrilla art, um, high impact visuals. So banners and silk screens and sign making, etc. And we really um, had, a, had a, an awesome time spending, the time that we spent with the people who were at Sandy Rock was really an um, amazing time. But at this, um, so since we were here, we decided that we'd like to have a panel discussion on juxtaposing, comparing correlations between Mauna Kea and Standing Rock and thinking about what, what worked, what didn't work, and what's next on the horizon for us as we continue to struggle together alongside one another. And so without uh, further ado, I want to int introduce our panelists. Um, of course, one of the greatest Hawaiian minds of our generation, Kalekoa Ka'il, Professor of Hawaiian Studies, Hawaiian Language, and an all-around great political theorist. Um, all the way from, well, mixed from Standing Rock, Lakota Territory, to Montana, um, and New Mexico, Crystal Rain Tubuls. She's uh, Oglala Lakota and Cheyenne, and she is a campaign organizer builder around the country with an organization she started called Voices of the Sacred. And she was a huge part of the Standing Rock, the No Dapo Divestment Campaign. Huge part of that. I also want to introduce one of the greatest Lakota minds of our generation. Educator, poet, activist. Um, he was at Standing Rock for almost five months through all, the, through all of it. If anybody has a handle on the politics of Standing Rock, internal and external, this guy does. Mark Tilson from Porcupine, South Dakota. And last but definitely not least, um, I want to introduce my wahine, my partner, my comrade, um, the mother of my children, um, Native Hawaiian attorney for the Native Hawaiian Legal Corporation, one of the greatest Hawaiian attorneys of our time, one of the world's foremost experts in Native Hawaiian rights, because there's only like five people doing it, Camille <laughs> Kalama. And so we're gonna um, really start off maybe by talking about, talking about the movement side the movement, the, 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 the activist side, the, the land occupation, what that was like for Mauna Kea and for Standing Rock, how it happened, and the power of, of activism on the ground, occupying the land, blockades, nonviolent direct action. Um, we want to start there, and, 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 and I guess the question is, how does, how does nonviolent direct action, how does civil resistance, how does civil disobedience 
benefit us? What's the value to that in um, places like Mauna Kea and Standing Rock? Kaleko says women first, ladies first. Say it again. No. <laughs> Can you guys hear me? Yeah, so we want to just, just a bit a talk, a talk about okay. what role does civil resistance, nonviolent direct action play in, in struggle for rights, in okay. struggle against corporations, against the government? What's the, what's, the, what's the good, the bad, the ugly? What's the value? Right. So, you know, coming from an attorney perspective and fighting in the courts, um, I think there can be a real tendency for people involved in the court cases to discourage direct action, to discourage civil resistance for the fear that it might impact the, the case. And for us that are fighting those cases um, for our people, that's exactly the opposite because the civil resistance, the nonviolent direct action is what shows everyone, including the court, because they're people too, that people, that we care that there, is, there are people out there that are still fighting for the rights that we're talking about on paper. Without the people practicing, without our people engaging in, in tradition and customary practices, without our people talking about it, being there, we don't have anything to fight for. The paper is nothing. We can talk about it all we want, but without people doing it, it's meaningless. So it's critical. And to me, it's... it's very evident in the different cases that we see how important that it is because as we saw Haleakala, you know, unfortunately the circumstances are different. It was really hard to stop those trucks and by the time we got through the court cases, the telescope was almost built and we tried and tried, filed injunction after injunction to get the court to stop it just so we could get to our argument and that didn't happen. Mauna Kea, we were able to hold it off and the people were able to hold off the construction until the court was able to rule. And it's not that one is more important than the other, that the court is so important, but sometimes that action makes it possible for the court to make a meaningful decision, right? Something that actually has an effect. We didn't get justice out of it. They didn't outright, you know, end the, end the project. They just gave us more process, but that also gives us time. So... I think we also see some of the same things at Sounding Rock, that there was a lawsuit going on, and there was action, direct action going on. And without that camp, without the people there on the ground protesting that, the court action, how many people would have heard about it? I don't think we in Hawaii would have even known. I certainly wouldn't. What I saw was the images of the people getting tear gas, getting dogs, you know, attacking them. And that brought us out there in October. And our, our keiki, they saw that and they're like, mom, you gotta go. Dad, you gotta go, help them, you know? So it wasn't the court case that brought the people out to support Standing Rock, gotta say that. Um, but that doesn't mean it doesn't matter, you know? I think that the main thing is that we all have tools and we, we gotta fight all the battles because that's what we do as indigenous people. We gotta fight everywhere, be better, be stronger, be more akamai, be more on it because we're fighting a system that has more power than we do. Anyway, does that answer your question? Same question. Um, <clears throat> Nonviolent direct action gave us control of the narrative that we effectively could, could do actions that would have enough large, large enough impact that it gave the voices of our frontline people and our spokespeople and activists uh, the necessary audience to convey our ideas and our messages across in a way that court briefings uh, couldn't. Um, we, uh, it's not as if the legal team and the uh, frontline crew was like hand in hand necessarily. Uh, but when we were most effective, we uh, allowed each other to operate without, without getting in each other's way. And we understood that nonviolent direct action and these very iconic images were part of what would wake up the, the larger consciousness. Um, Standing Rock and the words Mini Wachoni are now heard throughout the globe because of what we did up there. 
uh, nonviolent direct action is a force multiplier for any cause that you are fighting. Um, civil disobedience is uh, necessary. Uh, coming out of Standing Rock, one of the things that I say is we need to normalize resistance. Um, and I'll say it again, we need to normalize resistance. Uh, we, it's really easy to say that the courts, the courts are going to be the ones who are going to win it in the long term. And being Lakota, being, in, being native, it, that's, a, that's a long shot. That's a severe long shot to let the courts decide. At, at the very best, we knew that we could stop them for a day. And if we could stop them for a day, maybe we could stop them for a week. And we ended up costing them half a billion dollars and delayed them by almost half a year. And we did, not, we did that not through the courts, but we did that through civil dis disobedience and nonviolent direct action and keep showing up again and again and again. Um, the role of nonviolent direct action, I think, um, definitely want to echo what both have said, but I think also it's, it's the power of the people, right? Like, so whenever we're out there and we start to engage nonviolent direct action and we, even if you don't understand what that is and you don't know how to define that, but you know you have to take action and you know you have to make a stand for something, that's what that's about. That's what nonviolent direct action is, and that's the power of the people. And for me, it, the most important thing, one of the most important things is having a voice. Um, you know, as indigenous peoples or original peoples of our own lands, we're the most silenced, we're the most ignored, and we're the most erased every single day. Our histories are erased from the books, our histories are ignored, our voices are silenced in the media. Um, and so for nonviolent direct action, we have, it's a tool, and it's a way for us to get our voices out there, and it's a way for not only to get our voices out there, but for our voices to hold power because of the impact and because of the numbers and because of the people that are behind that voice. And I think that's really important to remember when we're engaging in nonviolent direct action. And also that there's a diversity of tactics with nonviolent direct action, right? Like we don't all agree on everything. Everyone in this group right here, we don't all have the exact same politics. We don't all believe in the exact same things. But if we can get behind a diversity of tactics and move in the same direction, then that's power and we're moving together. And for me, that's what um, the power of nonviolent direct action is. And that's a, a very strategic and tactical, but just common sense role for nonviolent direct action. In that, in it, what, it's what makes sense to us, I think. Um, yeah, so I think that's one of the most important things is it's, it has power behind our voices. Vilina <clears throat> Mbeki, aloha, anuai. For me as an educator, you know, when I look at nonviolent direct action, there's two pieces that I always think of. The first, of course, is the consciousness that must be not re reborn or restored. Because the consciousness is really the key to the mobilizing and the organizing. Right? You can't have a bunch of zombies just coming out and taking orders. Yeah? What we need to do, of course, first of all, is to enlighten, restore and reclaim our own humanity, consciously first. Because I believe as one, as in the great book, right? As one think it, so one does. When you understand yourself as a human being, you understand your own humanity, you cannot help but behave like a human being. And not just ask for your humanity, but you will demand your humanity. Nonviolent action for me, or especially organized actions, are ones in which are actual steps of reclamation. I think exactly what was said about the narrative. The narrative of we just being victims, the narrative of we just being reactive and all, oh, nothing we can do and you can just go and testify and oh shucks man, look what they're doing to us, can quickly be erased and replaced with a conscious effort, an organized effort to say, hey, we no longer accept dehumanization or we no longer accept our domination. And in fact, we will resist. And the resistance, again, can be in many different forms. But to me, that's a, I think it's a very important element. And, and I would say for me, you know, all action for me has to, and in, in the Hawaiian sense, I would argue, you always have to have a cultural, you know, cultural integrity to me is the most important element. 
whatever we do has to have that sense of integrity. Yeah, you don't do things just because, in other words, um, and let me give you examples. Yeah, you're not going to take, um, uh, actually there was a movie that was made about this, <laughs> kind of uh, low C-rated movie where, you know, some, some, some Hawaiian activists, uh, in order to stop a development, dug up some bones or made these fake bones and, and planted in the, in the, you know, in the development area. Which is a tactic. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying I wouldn't do that. <laughs> but the first step you should realize, right, you gotta, is that something that shows our integrity, that we got to go and behave like the oppressor, you know, to free us. You see, for me, I think the integrity is the peace. Yeah, yeah what happened, or what is happening in Dakota, what is happening in other places of the world that stand against this domination in a sense, it's about our own humanity, our own cultural ways, our own sense of who we are in this world. And to behave in this, in fact, we were talking earlier about the language of, you know, oh yes, yeah, so, you know, being radical. And of course, you know, when you think about what is, what is it to be radical, but really to be traditional. But you see the discourse, they try to say, oh, you're a bunch of radical Hawaiians. But in reality, our cultural integrity is, is not about, it's nothing radical about being traditional. It's nothing radical about saying, hey, I protect my sacred sites. There's nothing radical to say, hey, leave our ancestral remains in the ground where they are. There's nothing radical about that. That's something that's a tradition. That's at the heart of who we are as a people. And the second thing is to remember, I really have no care to prove to the so-called oppressor the masters, or I have to make sense in their eyes of what we see. The thing is that it's really important for us to decide for ourselves what's most important. What's integrity for us? I don't have to prove to an anthropologist. I don't have to prove to a judge, Judge Amano, that Mount Nakia is sacred. And then who the hell are they to decide for us? See, that's the part of the brain we gotta, in our consciousness raising, realize, not that they have no say or understanding, but who the hell are they to decide that for us? You see, and once, once you overstake that process, being traditional, having this kind of culture integrity, you cannot help but organize yourself and mobilize yourself in ways to do what is necessary, not just to protect our culture integrity, but to revive and restore this culture integrity. And so just to kind of add real, real quickly at the end, you know, when I look at what happened at you know, Standing Rock, you know, we were talking about this earlier, the, the connections between Mount Nuk and Standing Rock are definitely clear. Unlike what Governor Ige said to the press was, you know, there's no connection between Mount Nakia and Standing Rock. Of course he would say that, knowing how much Standing Rock even affected many Hawaiians here in Hawaii. You see, because for all peoples, it is a universal truth that all peoples have a right to define for themselves their destiny, their culture integrity. This is the, not a human right, this is a right for all peoples. Not to be defined by a state court judge or a federal judge or some corporation, or some investors, that somehow we should mitigate our pain for their economic benefit. So when I look at nonviolent action, I, I would, I, I, for me, it is as cultural, let me be clear about this, it is as cultural as you can be as a Kanaka, to stand as a Kanaka. There is nothing in a culture, there is nothing in a culture that says we must accept foreign domination. Nothing. In fact, it is most in our culture to say we refuse to accept foreign domination and we believe it is our right to determine for ourselves our future. So, anyway. My Kako. My name is Ely Malong, and sorry I turned up a little bit late for the introductions, but. Um, going to help co-moderate this panel and, and ask the next question. So the, the next question, speaker, my voice right in my ear. Um, the next question that I have is, it's sort of a, how do we get ready um, for the future, right? Because these fights are not over by any means, but I'm going to be a little bit more specific than that. Hopefully that's helpful. Um, you know, with, with Mauna Kea, and I think even with Standing Rock, there was this real sudden mobilization of people, whether it was to the Mauna to defend it from, you know, the, the, the trucks and, and construction, or whether it was to Standing Rock. And, and boy, did we see a mobilization at Standing Rock. 
And I think to some degrees, but to more of a degree with Standing Rock, there was actually more than mobilization. There was some real organizing going on that took off nationwide, right? So when we think about the difference between mobilization, where everybody just converges and gathers and does what they got to do, and then we go home, right? Um, versus organizing, where we, where we really think through an objective and we, we bring all kinds of people and roles in that are necessary to meet that objective. My question is, moving towards organizing to win our battles, whether it's Mauna Kea or different pipelines, what are some of the roles that you, in reflection, um, saw that we could have used more of? Um, or or what, were, what were things that were maybe lacking that we can think real specifically about organizing around or beefing up to support an organized effort to win? Go. <laughs> Is that to one of us, or what? All of, you. All of us? Whoever feels compelled. Sure. Anyone want? Okay. One minute. One minute, time me. Um, that was a great question because I think that a lot of us saw, you know, the occupation on the Mauna and we saw the occupation at Sanding Rock and we have a tendency to focus on that and think about that and how we can do that better. But really, we got to start here. You know, we got to start where we are because a sustained occupation on Mauna Kea takes a lot of resources. It takes a lot of effort, a lot of sacrifice for our people. And, and, um, it's difficult to sustain. So we got to think about ways that we can organize and get our messages out from home, from where we are, and start working together now so that we can get ready for that, you know? Um, I think that's the main thing. One thing that I think is critical that we have um, our friends, our cousins, our relatives here helping us with is that messaging part, that we can improve on that. We can work on that and make sure that we reach people not only here, but people elsewhere who, are, um, who we want to support us and work on that in a very intentional, consistent way as we move towards um, that final action. Because really, once we get on the Mauna, that means the trucks are coming, right? That's the end of the line. We want to get ready way before that. And there's a lot that happens between now and then, and that will probably be April of next year. So we have somewhat of a time frame to plan for. But it's not like we're all going to run up there right now and, and start camping, right? But what can we do here and now to start getting those messages out? What can we or organize around now to start putting that message out ahead of the game and not wait to the last minute? Um, one of the things that I wish we did uh, more effectively is actual boycotting of every single gas station that uh, profits from the Dakota Access Pipeline directly, indirectly, or is owned by any of the pumpers, the shippers, or the manufacturers. We were busy in camp trying to shut down a pipeline, though, so that didn't happen. But what, it, but what can happen now around Mauna Kea and any other fights is finding the vulnerabilities, identifying who are the key players and where are they vulnerable. If it's the University of Hawaii, where are they vulnerable? Is it possible to organize student walkouts? Is it possible to organize a general strike on the campuses through the, jan through the janitors, through the teachers, through the, through the staff? Who can be mobilized? Um, but the, but oh, when your enemy is very big and very strong, they're also incredibly vulnerable. They are vast, and you can target and strategically target any of their points. Uh, and you just kind of find these pressure points, and again, relying on the tactics of civil disobedience and resistance, you can disrupt their normal life while maintaining this me while maintaining this powerful, powerful message every time that you do it. So we might be trying to get, we don't, might be trying to going after the money, seeing who's investing in this telescope, who would profit from them, and then making sure that this is an incredibly unprofitable, um, or at least unpopular idea. And the more unpopular the idea it becomes, the less and less people will want to put, that, put their money there. Um, 
that's one of the things that I really wish we did a, a, a better job of at Standing Rock is just kind of doing a full court press, like being able to take a bird's eye view of where the struggle is currently at and then finding those key moments to really press home. Um, for me, you know, Standing Rock exploded basically uh, in a short amount of time and so Looking back on it, I think one of the things that I would make really central to the movement would be the healing and the reconnection to our culture. I mean, because one of the complexities and the dynamics that played out at Standing Rock was the fact that we're dealing with generations upon generations of historical trauma and colonization. Um, and so a lot of our people, they're still in those places of being colonized. They're still in those places of not understanding their culture. And they're still in those places of just now learning how to reconnect. And so when you have dynamics like that on top of um, hundreds, literally hundreds of different nations coming together that have their own stories of historical trauma, their own ways of colonization and how it played out. When you have, um, you know, the military and the militarization, uh, that's a component of, of it. Whenever you have the disconnection and the loss of language, that's a component. All of these dynamics played out very clearly in Standing Rock. And I think had we had we put healing and reconnection, um, at least as a central focal point, I think it would have changed the dynamics a little bit. Um, but again, the way we exploded, um, I don't know if that would have been possible to do that because it was such a huge group and there were so many different groups of people there that didn't necessarily believe in the same things that we did, but believed in other politics that brought them to that, sp that space. Um, the other thing I think was training. I think a lot of people had showed up and they didn't have training in nonviolent direct action. And so they showed up and a lot of folks were almost liabilities because there was no training, there was no understanding, there was no discipline within that. Um, relationship building, that's huge. That is what helped Standing Rock be as large as it was. That helped us be effective is because the relationships that each one of us as organizers, as people had, and we, we relied on our relationships. Andre showed up because we knew each other from other events and other places. And so he was able to bring that. Um, the Palestinian youth movement is big. The labor for Standing Rock, the unions, the churches, all of these different groups were all based on relationships. And I think that's so important, especially now that we're having uh, more in-depth conversations about Mauna Kea and Standing Rock and all the other movements and bringing them together in this united force, it's important to carry that as we move forward, that we're not just building this tactically, we're genuinely in relationship to each other. Your struggle is my struggle. Your win is my win. You know, your, your pain is my pain. So I think the relationships are really important. Um, I also think that campaign building. Had we had more training on what the difference between campaigns, tactic, and strategy were, that would have been big. I think a lot of people got stuck in tactic and only wanting to do actions. Let's do a protest. Let's do an action. But people forgot that we can actually build large scale campaigns that are international. Um, that don't see boundaries. And so I think that's really important. Our divestment campaign was evidence of how powerful that could have been. So I think we could have put a little bit more emphasis on our boycott and our divestment campaigns or even other larger campaigns that we didn't see yet. I think that would have um, helped make a difference in the long run as well. I get three points. I hope I remember. So. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But first, I totally agree in regards to the economic question, which was something we did not really approach at all in regards to, or our approach at all in regards to Mauna Kea and Haleakala struggle. <clears throat> I mean, if you look at the struggle with South Africa, it was a huge struggle, long struggle. But one of the reasons in which it was able successfully to end apartheid had to do with the push, not just within the United States, but internationally in regards to uh, uh, the investment and, and ways economically, which had made it economically horrible for the white South Africans to continue apartheid. If you look at the Mauna Kea situation, we know the Mauna Kea construction, it's, it, this is a private industrial corporation. Canada, India, China, uh, Caltech, and in Japan, and of course, University of Hawaii at Hilo all involved. So there is a huge possibility, in fact, in reaching out perhaps to those countries or reaching out in other ways 
to affect the investment to back this construction on our lands. So that's something we still haven't even tapped into. Secondly, as uh, you know, the great Harriet Tubman said, and it's a you know real common quote. You know, I'd freed a thousand slaves. I'd freed a thousand more if they only knew there were slaves. I mean, think about that. Freed a thousand slaves. I'd freed a thousand more if they only knew. See, part of the question about as horrific as slavery was, many slaves did not escape, escape slavery, not just because of fear, but not even recognizing they're in a situation that's not a natural situation. Had they become a natural situation through the domination. So when you look at education as a piece, when I look at Mauna Kea, one of the things I always say is if we get 5,000 people in Mauna Kea, we will win that struggle. The question is, how to get 5,000 people on Mauna Kea ready to resist? It's through consciousness. It's through them understanding what Mauna Kea is, what it represents, and what it means to our people. See, that the truth is most of our people, and that's a, that's a sad fact, most of our people, which has been changing, it's growing, still do not have a clear understanding about Mauna Kea. Now, the good news, as I always say also, you know, our people are waking up from this deep sleep. And as we start to awaken more and more and more, you can quickly see the potential that is there. That is huge. An educated, organized, Hawaiian, unified body is the most dangerous thing for the master settlers in Hawaii. How do we get there? Yeah, educating one another. Now, when we all get there, see, this is the last piece which is all brought up. It's not a matter of just getting everybody there. So we get 5,000 Hawaiians running around in Mount Nakia, then what? See, this is when it becomes very important that we have to be educated in an organized fashion, whether it's through nonviolent, you know, direct action, or whether it's through cultural events, whatever, whatever it may be. But we have to, at this point already now, in fact, I would say we're already behind the times now, already be organizing ourselves in a way to know what we will do, to know how we will be organized, how will we feed ourselves, how will we set up settlements up there, how will we protect and provide security for ourselves. These are the kinds of answers that not just one person has, but all of us together has. There's a role for everybody to play in this struggle. Everybody has a role. You know, from security to cooking to cleaning to standing on the front line to passing out flyers to playing with your Facebook to talking to your neighbor down in Waianae, whatever it might be. See, the point is, we all have a role. And who, whose kuleana is this? It's our kuleana. It's on us. If we fail about this, there's nobody to blame but ourselves, as I would say. You know? And again, going back to the, the Herod Tubman, this is the part where we must awaken our people from their conditions and situation to understand. When they say this, and again, going back to this question about the narrative, I think it's most important. We, again, must control the narrative. This is not about Hawaiians fighting against science. This is really about foreign, the foreign master settlers trying to decide for us what is best for us for our own sacred lands. That's really the heart of the whole matter. You see, so we, but we get caught up in those kinds of discussions. We get led astray in trying, again, trying to prove to the scientists or prove to the government in their language, in their process somehow, that we should be respected as people. See me, I refuse to stay and wait. I'm not, not going to be the slave asking the slave master to be free. You know, we need to be like Nat Turner perhaps. And do whatever it takes to get rid of the slave owner if need be. And anyway, I know I went over my time here, so call am I. <laughs> so we got about 20 minutes more, and um, we want to ask more questions. Um, I'm going to ask a question that might be tough to answer, and it's taken from the title, the title of a poem that Mark Tilson wrote. And the poem was, 
regarding nonviolent direct action, that was the context, and civil disobedience and resistance. And the title of his poem was, What Do You Do When Your Elders Are Wrong? What do you do when your elders are wrong? And what I mean by that is we, on Mauna Kea and at Standing Rock, we had kupuna, people that we respect. We had elders, we had leaders that didn't think we, were, we should be doing what we were doing. We had people who thought we shouldn't be blocking the road. We shouldn't be doing nonviolent direct action. And there were some on, on Mauna Kea and at Standing Rock who tried to suppress civil resistance and civil disobedience. So what do we do about that? Oh man, that is a tough one. Good point. Um, <laughs> one of the things that, uh, like, just for further background information, we had um, we had a series of uh, a mysterious elders, anonymous elders, who people would come to shut down nonviolent and direct actions and say, go back to camp, go back to camp and pray. And we're like, well, who, who said? Who are you operating off of? And they're like, the elders said. And we're like, which ones? And they never said. So there was somebody in camp who, without any legitimate authority of either traditional governance or even through the systems that were created organically through the camp, was propagating the idea that all actions should stop. And with, with proper rumor control and accountability, you can squash that. What's worse is when you actually have legitimate elders, respected elders, who disagree with what you're doing. Um, that is much, much more difficult to deal with. One of our most respected Lakota elders went up to the only spot you could land from the water to the drill pad where they're going to drill directly underneath the Missouri River and they did a ceremony and put up a medicine bundle there and says we cannot take the drill pad because there's medicine up there now and it was to the point where like we would have to disobey our most respected elders and I actually think we should have done it. Um, what we do when your elders are wrong, uh, first off, love them, appreciate them, genuinely listen, like seriously, seriously listen. For indigenous people, for native people, being ignored is, it, it's, it kills the spirit. It actually hurts our spirit. And some of our elders, due to the like, uh, contemporary mainstream society, elders don't really have a place. They're meant to be considered irrelevant and pushed to the side. Being Lakota, we, we often don't want to even question our elders. We want to th say what they think is best because we want to imagine that they have the connection to the old knowledge of how we ought to be. Um, and what we can do in t to honor them is genuinely, truthfully listen. The second component, um, you got to respectfully disagree. You got to keep it respectful. It doesn't even need to be in public. But you just have to more or less tell the people, your elders, saying, thank you for your advice. Thank you for advising us wisely and to the best of your ability. I disagree with your advice. And lastly, you have to move on. You cannot let the previous generation dictate everything that's going to happen. And also, you're going to have elders that are going to back you. Every single action, no matter how big or strong or utterly terrifying, had elders on the front lines. We almost lost one of our elders the night that they hit it, They hit people with the water cannons. He was out on the front lines and went into cardiac arrest. And, and we had other elders who never showed up, but we had them right side by side. The only difference, I guess, is many of our frontline elders were, they kind of followed a traditional role of being humble enough to not try to exert authority. So when they supported something, they showed up to support it. Um, but that's the final message: is you have to keep going. That even when you dis, even when you, your elders are wrong and they make the bad call, you can't let that be the end. This was a really tough question. <laughs> um, 
but I, I mean, I agree with everything Mark said. Uh, again, like the dynamics were really complex, and we have, in in my community, I'm actually uh, Oglala Lakota, Northern Cheyenne. So I was raised in Montana, southeastern Montana, um, amongst Cheyennes, and we always talk about historical trauma and how our elders are unfortunately closer to that trauma. Um, and so us as younger people, even though we are younger and we don't carry a lot of that knowledge innately, we haven't lived long enough to gain a lot of that knowledge, a lot of our elders that do carry that knowledge, they were closer to the trauma. So their experience and the way their behavior is coming out is, it's based on their trauma. It's based on colonization. It's based on the fact that what they experienced is not the same thing that as what we experience now, today. Um, and I think taking that into consideration, it is really difficult to make those tough choices when you're when you're out there and you see elders who you care for and who, for me, I was related to like almost everybody at that camp. Um, you know, I come from a really big family, um, a family of chiefs and a family of warriors, and and I was related to a lot of people that carried a lot of different political beliefs. And for me, it came to a point where I had to leave camp. Um, I just I left for a while because no choice I made was going to appease everybody that I cared about and everybody that I loved. And so I had to remove myself and find another role and another responsibility for myself um, to be able to go through that process, to be able to like maintain these relationships of love and family, uh, but also know that I have a responsibility to that land. I have a responsibility to that water and I had to take a stand and I had to take action. And so I did it through other means, and we, you know, we really pushed out the divestment campaign. And um, you know, everything that you see out there, there was logistics that went behind it. There was organizing that went behind it. There was writing that went behind it. And and that's the stuff you don't hear about. But that's the stuff that I was doing. Is a lot of behind the computer type stuff. Whenever I left camp, so that way I could still maintain my integrity. You know, as a Lakota woman, as a Cheyenne woman, as a Native American woman, um, but also still take action and so for me that was the route that I went and it's not gonna look like that for everyone um, and I don't think it's ever gonna be easy but I think it's like Mark said we have to continue to push forward and we have to be able to take a step back and look at the big picture don't get stuck in the moment of, the, of you know knocking heads with an elder take a step back look at the big picture and know that there is a lot of work to be done and we can fill all these different roles and responsibilities so we just have to keep moving forward and do that but that's that's the best way that i came up with the the way around that sounds a lot of, like our struggle but i think um as kanaka and I'm not sure, maybe because um, in our culture, Kanawai, you know, or, or the law was, was black or white, it was death, you know, if you violate it. And so it was something that meant something. It was serious. And I think for our, some of our people, some of our kupuna, we have a tendency to rely on it, to have faith that we will get justice through this system. And we just need to wait and let the law, you know, let the court case run its course because we're right, you know, because we're Pono. We will come out in the end and we'll win. And it's really tough to explain or to, to listen. First, always listen, right, to them and let them tell their story. But to tell them, you know, the laws are made, created, enforced, interpreted by people. And the power is not in the paper. The power is not in the law and the statute. The power is in the people behind it and the power to change it. And we have examples from our own history that show that when there were no laws, we created them because of direct action, like the burial laws. It took jumping the fence at Honokahua before those laws were created to protect our historic you know, burials, our cultural tradition of not disturbing those burials. So. It's really tough because we respect our kupuna, our kupuna have a place just like, you know, you folks. Um, and to do it respectfully, and I think it goes back to what Kalekoa talked about in terms of cultural integrity. That if you think about what you want to do and they're telling you no, if you know that you are being true to, to our culture, being true to our traditions, and what, what you're doing is pona, and, and you're not doing it alone. 
you know, you have, you have people with you. And you have massive amounts of people with you, you know. Then you can move forward because you know that what you're doing is for that purpose. Because sometimes if we hear, you know, why not to do it, it's because, oh, we don't want to affect this. We don't want to, we don't want to discourage the court to try to influence them or we don't want to um, piss somebody off. And what are we fighting for? When we say, well, we're out there, we're going to stop it to protect our aina. We're stopping it to protect our land, the water for everyone. You know, um, to me, that's the main thing is that you go back and you find that purpose. If you're doing it to piss someone off, maybe you are wrong. You know? So it's something to think deeply about before you decide to do it. At this point, we've invited Great question, Andre. First, say, I'm being fortunate in my life that I've been around some real impressive kupuna and older generations perhaps who have been in a struggle for many, many, many great teachers. So I've been fortunate on many times having, I know I, that, as they say, they had my back. Because they've always told me, and some of them, some of them known as the, you know, I'm not going to drop the names, but, you know, pretty known, conservative, well-known kupuna would always come in. Keep on saying what you're saying. Keep on doing what you guys are doing. So there's always been a part of me that, that sometimes people say, what? You're not afraid to say this against that person? And for me, not really. It's not that I'm afraid. It's that I know that I have a backing of, of, of those who have already passed on and those who are still here. So for me, that's a heavy kulian, a heavy responsibility that you also carry. You know that sometimes even when you don't want to say something because it's uncomfortable. Even, you know, sometimes you don't want to do something because, oh, you know, it's, it's just, doesn't, it might be uncomfortable or offensive. But I know I carry a particular responsibility to say what needs to be said and sometimes to do the walk or walk what needs to be walked. Secondly, in my in our Hawaiian worldview, you know, I know my genealogy. I know my mokuaoha. I know who my certain kupuna are. And I know how they live their lives. And I know they would not take this from those who oppress us, you see. So I reach back to them. And I know in our genealogy, I know who I am, that I am them. And that's a very Hawaiian world view to understand. I'm not disconnected from them. I am the product of them. I am them today. And thirdly, as I was taught, the bottom line, yes, your Hawaiians, how do you know when something is right? You were blessed. Flip them. How do you know something is wrong? Did you want a headache? What tell you? The now. See, I was taught, you know, that's your kupuna talking to you. Don't trust this. This one gonna play games with you. This one gonna try to fake you out. But in the end, the now gonna speak to you. In the end, when you in that decisions of being uncomfortable sometimes. See, that's the test on us. That's the, that's the test on you. That's the test on me. That's the test of all of us. We need to turn and believe that the Na'au is telling us when it's right or wrong. Because I'm a firm believer that, that that is my kupuna speaking to me sometimes. And this is not an easy issue. I've had my own personal issues sometimes with very well-respected kupuna and very well-respected so-called activists. But what my approach has always been to very direct and be very honest. I don't run away. I don't hide. I don't... That's and I tell him, I explain to him exactly how I feel, why I feel this way. And when you decide what you need to do, you need to do, you do. But you always do with the sense of aloha. I'm not doing this because I'm trying to fatten my pocket. I'm not doing this to glorify my name. I'm not doing this to push myself here or push myself there. But you're going to do this because in here, you know that that's what's porno in the end. It's not, and in fact, what you find is it's not even a choice at the end. It's something that you must and need to do. So that's why now we have the word porno. Yeah. So for me, I think I think that's a very 
influence. Hard question. Started my father on this. But at the same time, going back to culture and character, that's really a real question. We must deal with today in this world. And what choice do we have but to deal with it in this way? So I tell all of us, follow you now. Okay, so we have three minutes left. And I just found that out. So I gotta think of a question that you will all answer in. Okay, so very, very briefly. Um, the, the short question is, what's next? Um, and, I, and I want us to keep in mind our audience, say there's like, I see a whole lot of young people in this audience, which is awesome. This is probably the biggest discussion 10 audience I've ever seen. Um, involvement, entryways, taking action, not waiting for a leader to say it's okay or to ask to come. So next steps and, and, and participation and engagement. Short. One of the things that I firmly believe is that we are already afraid. Like in many ways, the worst things that already are happening now, and we're afraid. Go at your enemies. Your heart will thank you because of it. Once you take their power away, there's nothing else. It's like you can shoot me and I win, and I already, or you go away and I win. As long as we keep going at them, we win. Next steps, uh, youth, that, uh, those, that is our next steps. Um, you know, our generations, we're here right now. We've done this much work, uh, we'll continue to do work. Those ahead of me, they've done that much work, they'll continue to do work. But right now, for me, um, investing in young people, that's gonna guarantee our future as original peoples. That's gonna be what carries us forward, is making sure that our young people are prepared and that they're ready to step up for the responsibilities that, um, that are coming no matter what. And then I also think uh, for engaging youth, um, arts. I mean, we're here, we've been here with uh, Andre at the Hanakehao farm and we've been doing art this whole, this last entire week. And I think that's one of the best ways that I've seen and I've witnessed and I, I know that has been effective to engage young people and to engage all people. Um, uh, yeah, so I think those are the, the next steps for me. I'm gonna close down. <laughs> uh, as an educator, everybody say, Iali ino, Iali, Ike kanaka. No, Iali ino, Iali, Ike kanaka. This means Iali is an Ali because of the people, meaning the people. Make the Ali. Now this is very important to understand. This is a different worldview than the Howley worldview, which is like, who's the leader? We gotta, you know Hawaiians, all we need is one leader to follow. Right? We gotta go follow this leader. That is a Howley mentality right now. The lesson from our kupuna is that we serve. We do. We do the work. It's not about looking for a leader. It's about serving. You see, because it's from the working and serving that the leadership will evolve. Because you see, leadership in the Hawaiian sense and native sense is very different. We don't have leadership in this way many times, but we have leadership in a kind of horizontal way. That we have different kuleana that we all can take and we all know we can take. So again, yali no, yali ike kanaka. Mahalo. Great question. I think um, if we're going to focus on right now, the struggle for Mauna Kea, um, between now and the next few months, think about what your role can be. Think about what your capacity is, your capability is, and what your interest is. You know, and find ways to um, train if you can. We started Huli, some of us, um, to as a training organization because we couldn't find nonviolent direct action training opportunities in Hawaii. Um, but there's, there's things that you can do now to start building capacity. Look for um, those in your hometown, you know, if you are from Hawaii Island, talk to the kia'i that you know. You know, there's a big group of them. 
um, find out what things that they need so you can serve because if you don't know what to do, find someone who does and try and figure it out, you know? Everybody has skills, everybody has a role, everybody can help and kokua. So find out what that thing is for you and do it. Don't wait. Yo, let's clap it up, let's clap it up everyone, come on. How about that panel? From Standing Rock. So I just want to make an announcement one time. Um, Huli, that's the Hawaiian Unity Liberation Institute. That's what um, Camille just mentioned earlier. Partner Andre uh, Perez, they have it on a Kehau farm. Um, they just wrapped up their art action camp with our brothers and sisters from Okuhonu. They're going to have look out for nonviolent direct action training. I just want to say a big mahalo to all the panel right here, but most especially for, I just want to mahalo for my own personal self. Andre, Camille, Kale Koa, Emima, Movement for Aloha no Kaina. These are my brothers and sisters that helped get me uh, in regards to awareness. Uh, somebody born fully colonized in the system, fully colonized in the system, and then now um, speaking for you know, unity, liberation, um, as well as organizing. So oh, let's give a big round of applause for our panel here. <laughs> So, so that wrapped up our panel. So we got some handouts there, Mahalo, guys. Mahalo, uh, Olelo Media. Now, if you are somebody who is uh, Facebook Live, you want to encourage that, please use the hashtag LHE2017. That's hashtag LHE2017.